Okay. Uh, the log uh, factor interacts uh, with consciousness. The log factor interacts with consciousness. Is that a question? Yes. Is that a question? Yes, it's a question. Okay. What I heard was the love factor interacts with consciousness. The luck factor. Ah, okay. The luck factor interacts with consciousness. Yes. You see, we have a rule set, but this rule set has a lot of uncertainty in it. World of Warcraft and The Sims are the same way, right? There's lots of rolling of the dice, if you will, in World of Warcraft to determine things that happen. There's lots of chance involved in it. Because if there wasn't chance involved in it, it would get pretty boring, wasn't it? Everything would be predictable. We don't want that. We want choices that challenge us. We don't want choices that we've already memorized the answer to. That doesn't challenge us. So we need novelty. We need things to be stirred up. We need uncertainty. We need chance. We need luck. We need that to create the uncertainty with which gives us the choices which lets us evolve. Now, there's luck, so that's one sort of luck. Things happen, you know, that are just chance. And, and part of that randomness is our interactions. You got seven billion people interacting with each other. You see, Mexico City, I don't know how many millions of people you have here interacting with each other. And because of all that interaction, it's really, really hard to predict what might happen on any given day. That's good. It's bad if you want to control everything, but it's good if you just want a lot of great opportunities to make good choices. So we welcome this uncertainty. Now the other connection with luck or randomness or uncertainty is that because we create our own reality, we also create our own luck or lack of it. People who are lucky are people who are people who are lucky are people who have strong intent. People who are unlucky are people who have strong intent. But what they don't have is focus. So if you modify the probability of your intent, so the things happen according to your intent, and you happen to have a negative intent all the time, then these are the people who are unlucky. They can never get a break. Oh, we're not getting, we're not getting translation? Ah, okay. Hello, testing, okay, that works, I got it. All right, I'll start that over. The, uh, I think I told you the first thing about luck or uncertainty is that we need it. Uncertainty is good. Uncertainty generates opportunity. Uncertainty makes life interesting, gives us challenges, things happen we're not ready for, so we react to it from the gut, we react to it from, from the being level because we're not prepared. Otherwise, our intellect would have us prepared for everything, and it would be hard to learn anything. So we need uncertainty. But there's also another aspect of consciousness and uncertainty, or consciousness and luck, and that is because we modify reality, because we change the probability of what will happen with our intent, then we create our luck, good or bad. If we're negative, and our thoughts tend to always be about, oh, woe is me, Nothing ever happens good for me. We create bad luck. If we think positive, you know, that everything is great. I love this place. 
I can't wait for the next challenge to come along and I can make good choices. If we have that kind of attitude, things tend to fall our way because we modify those probabilities that represent us. The future represents us, express us. So yes, luck is made as well as just, you know, it's just chance. We create that and that's even true if you're playing cards, you know, if you're, if you're playing cards or you're spinning the roulette wheel, those people who get on winning streaks, it's because of the way, it's because of the altered state they get into. It's because of the focus of their intent and the level of their confidence, and that creates winning streaks. And those people that always have losing streaks, it's the same thing. It has to do with fear and confidence, which have to do with, of course, your, your consciousness. So we create a lot of our luck. If you feel particularly lucky that everything has just kind of fallen in place for you, you probably have a very positive outlook on life. If you feel that you're unlucky and every time you almost get something, there's something that takes it away from you, you know, you're always, uh, uh, what is that? What's the saying? You know, you're always grabbing uh, uh, defeat from the jaws of victory or victory from the jaws of defeat. Then you, uh, you're making this happen. You're biasing. It's not that you make every event happen. You're just biasing events to turn out that way more often than they would otherwise. Okay. So that should answer that question. You got a, another question? Turn this off. She turns that on. Your microphone on. And you turn it. Nos puedes explicar la diferencia entre el tiempo lineal? lineal time? Ah. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Nos puedes explicar la diferencia entre el tiempo lineal y el tiempo and uh, time? Can you explain the difference between lineal time and time? Hello. Yes, I can explain something about time. Time is an inter interesting thing. Time comes into this discussion along with consciousness. Okay, so time started, we're just, we're just assuming time because the assumption that a consciousness can tell this way from that way has an underlying assumption that's unspoken of time. Because what's a this way or that way? Right? But this way or that way means it's changed in time. It was this way, now it's that way. It was a one, now it's a zero. You see, so if you're going to have, if you're going to have uh, something that can differentiate states like that, then you've already implied that there's time. But now that time is not regular time. That's what we'll call primordial time. It's not tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. That's regular time. Regular time, which means a, we're keeping time now with a steady beat, it means a metronome. That was created when the larger consciousness system had, a, had an epiphany. The larger consciousness system had one of those aha moments when it was evolving that realized that out of all these patterns and patterns of patterns, and it needed some more novelty, it needed a way to lower entropy more, more complexity, and it came up with sequences of patterns. Oh, we want to sequence things. But we want to sequence them in a way that it's meaningful, that there's content to the sequence. For that you need regular time. So it just took two of its this way, that way, this way, that way, and started flipping states in a regular way. That was the first clock. That was the first metronome. And then it could sequence patterns based on how many ticks and how many talks between patterns and so on. That invented time as we know it. So that's the origin of time. Now time uh, is fundamental. Space is not fundamental. 
Space is just computed. Elf has space. The characters in, in The Sims, they live in space. They live in three-dimensional worlds. They go inside houses that have volume. You know, they live in a volume. It's just computed. It's not fundamental at all. Time is fundamental. You can't have growth without time. Growth means you were this way before, now you're that way. There is no growth without time. Everything just stays the same if there's no time. You see, time is very fundamental. Space is virtual. Okay, so this was time. Regular time then was an invention. It was a, a new technology invented by consciousness in order to help it lower its entropy, help it evolve. Now there's a whole nother dimension that it could gain complexity and in interaction in. Hmm? Uh, all right. It's on. Okay, it's working. Ah, yay! It's all right. That's why I have a boss. Boss keeps me straight. Okay, so it invented time was a technology to allow it to grow. Time was a whole other dimension in which it could evolve complexity and patterns and interactions because now it had sequences. You see? So that's time as we know it. Now, what about the time here in this virtual reality? You know, what TikTok's on my watch here? What is that time? That time is derived not from the fundamental time, not from the, the uh, primordial time, not even from the regular time, but this time is derived from the time loop in the simulation. A dynamic simulation calculates the results of all the states this delta t, and then it increments delta t, that's a little chunk of time, forward, and then it calculates all the states again, and then it increments delta t. Remember I gave that example, we're throwing a ball, and the ball's going through space. Now here's the ball, a delta t later, it's here, a delta t later, it's here, a delta t later, it's here, and the ball does this trajectory. Every delta t, the simulation of the ball moves time a little further and we have dynamic equations that describe how this ball goes on a parabola you see because gravity has an inverse square law so we get parabolas out of this trajectory and our simulation can be crude here it is here it is and there it is or our simulation can be so fine that we only move a hundredth of a millimeter every delta t and you can't see any jerkiness in it at all it's perfectly smooth that time, which is our time, is the, the simulation loop. That's a time that's just local to this simulation. It's our local time. Some other simulation has their own loop. That's their time. And their time, their, their time may be a smaller increment or a bigger increment than us. So time in virtual realities can be different one to the other to the other. Time doesn't pass the same in your dream state, does it, as it passes in this state. You can go into the dream state and do things that you swear took you a week, and you find out it only you know, it was a half an hour, or vice versa. You, know, you can do things in a, dream, in a dream state, sometimes the time works the other way around, where you've been kicking and thrashing in the bed for an hour and you know somebody wakes you up and you've only got a 30 second story to tell. So time is different in different reality frames. It doesn't work the same. You can't translate from one time to the other. So we have our local time and that delta T is very, very small because we have, it looks like a continuous time here. We think our watches just tick off seconds Seconds are defined in terms of oscillations of a cesium clock, used to be defined in terms of how long it took for a revolution of our planet to go around the sun. So we, these are local times. Our little delta T in our simulation is approximately 10 to the minus 44 seconds. 
That's a very small number, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. That's a 10 with a decimal place. That's a one zero. And then we'll move our decimal place backward. So the 10 goes to a one, then to a point one, then a point zero one, then to a point zero zero one, and keep doing that for you know, all those zeros. 44 times you move it over. That's a whole lot of zeros, a decimal point and a whole lot of zeros before you get to the 10. So 10 to the minus 44 seconds. We see that as absolutely continuous, just like we see our movies as absolutely continuous when they actually are one still frame, the next still frame, the next still frame. It's a whole series of still frames. And we see that as fluid continuous motion. That's the way we see it here. Time is digital at the base. It's not continuous. Space then is also digital at the base and not continuous. So that's kind of the story of time. You have primordial time that just came in with an assumption that you have this and that, a differentiation. And that's required if, you, if you're going to assume that consciousness exists. You can't have consciousness that doesn't do anything or go anywhere or have any choices, then it's not consciousness. Remember, free will, choice is one of the attributes of consciousness. You can't have consciousness without choices. You can't have choices without a before state and an after state. I make a choice. You know, it was like this, now I choose, it's like that. So time is fundamental for consciousness. So when I say that we start with the assumption that consciousness exists, we've started with an assumption of primordial time existing. And when I talk about a limit to our knowledge, the bacterium in our stomach just doesn't know about the light bulb in our refrigerator, we know about it, but it doesn't because it just can't get there, never can get there. It's not, a, it's not because the bacterium isn't smart enough, it's that the bacterium just can't get there. We just can't get past that assumption with consciousness. But it's a pretty good assumption because, hey, we're conscious. So consciousness exists is pretty solid. If consciousness didn't exist, we wouldn't be here talking to each other, you see? So we know that consciousness exists. So we just start at the earliest place we can start, which is that consciousness exists. We can't start any earlier than that because we're consciousness. We can't see before that. So what's the origin of that primordial time? Don't know. Won't know. It's, it's the light bulb in the refrigerator, the me, the intestinal bacterium. It's just something out there. Now, does that mean that it's not important? No. Those light bulbs in the refrigerator, those grocery stores, those farmers are very important to what goes down into that intestine where those bacteria are. But those bacteria don't know anything about it. And there's no sense them worrying about it because they'll never know anything about it. They can't. But it doesn't mean that what they don't know about isn't important, isn't significant, and isn't understood on another, another level someplace. That elf doesn't know anything about its server. There's no server in that elf's reality. There's just the map the elf runs around in. The server is non-physical, beyond its knowing, and very important. But, you see, it has to just let that go. So that's where we are with time. You know, time is, is, uh, is a local thing. So, I made that question. I made that question, and I really wanted to see if we can at the same time, we need different lights. Okay. okay. Okay, I can talk to that too. We'll just... Uh, maybe we are living here now and... Yeah. The, we, can you parallel... The that we had before. Can you parallel process? Yeah. Okay, well, there's a couple of things going on there with time. You've had other lives at other times, and maybe this is a confusion you're talking about. You often will hear people say, it's very in vogue belief to say, there is no time, everything, everything simultaneous, the past, the present, and the future are all happening at once. Everything happens at the same time, you know, so there's really no time, and it's all at once, and the past, the present is all happening, it's all real, it's all going on at the same time. It's just not true. It's a nice thought, but it's not true. Okay. I think the way that got started, at least the first time I heard that was about 25, 30 years ago when I read Seth Speaks. I don't know if you're familiar with Seth Speaks or not. It was a book that was channeled by Jane Roberts. It was a very popular book back in the late 60s, early 70s. 
and it had a big effect on everything that came afterwards. And Seth made a statement something like that. And that's been picked up and, and uh, used ever since. Here's, I think, where the confusion came from. When you channel things, of course, it's the same thing. You're getting a data stream, and the channeler has to voice that data stream. And when the channeler voices that data stream, they have to interpret the data in terms of their own understanding and in terms of their own knowledge, fears, everything else. So it's their interpretation. So you expect in this kind of a channel data that you get some noise and you get some confusion because you've got an interpretation between the source and what comes out, okay? So I think what was being said was that all of these things exist at the same time in the sense that at any time you can go to the probable future and look at the probable future. You can go to the past, whether it was the actualized past or the unactualized past, and you can explore in it, and you can explore in the future, and you can do that today, right now, this second, you know, if you have your attention there. So anytime you can do that. So here you have the future and the past and the present, and it's all accessible at the same time. That, I think, is what he was thinking. But the probable future is only a probable future. The past, again, it's, it's just what happened. It's a database. It's the database of everything that happened and the database of everything that could have happened but didn't and the probability that it might have happened. It's just a database, you see? So that database where you say your past life is in that database, it's just it's like, data, like a book in a library except it's a better library because the book contains all your feelings, all your thoughts, you know, everything you did, everything you wanted to do but didn't, all of those things are there along with probabilities that you made other choices besides the ones you made. It's just a database. So when you go visit those past lives, they're not populated by people with free will making choices and growing the quality of their consciousness. It's just data. In the future, it's the same way. It's just a probability of things going on. There's nothing, the characters you see there are just acting out the probability that's in the database. The only place that has free will where all the learning and action goes on is right here in the present. You see, that's, that's it, here in the present. So that database there, it looks like it's alive because the database is so complete that when you go into that past life, you can be there, you can see the action, the people interacting, you know, the horses running down the field, the apple falling out of the tree, all of it's very real. And when you're there, just as, as uh, was said earlier, sometimes it's more real than here. And you can interact with that. You can watch it like you're watching a movie or you can get into it and change choices. And the choices will change based on the probabilities of what would have happened given that choice instead of another choice. So it's a great place to do what if analysis. You can go back in that past database and say, well, let's see what would happen if I hadn't forgotten my wife's anniversary five years in a row. If I hadn't done that, where would I be now? Maybe we'd still be married, you know, or maybe this would, you know, or if I had, if I had married, you know, Mr. A instead of Mr. B, you know, what would my life be like now? You can do that because it's just a probability. And you could say, I'd like to see the most probable thing that would have happened after I make this different choice. And then you can like watch it like a movie. Or you can play the character and get in the role and make choices as you go. Or you can say, you can have an intent, I'd like to see the third most probable thing happen. And then you'll get that and that'll be a different story. It's a database, you're querying it, you can query it any way you like, you see? but people don't understand that, so they wander into it. They see it, it's like a movie. It seems like it's live. There's characters, they're doing something. There's struggles, there's fights. You know, the knights have on their armor, they're charging on their horses, things happen, and oh, that was me, you know, and you see all this going on, and it seems so real and so alive, just like watching the big screen, right? It's uh, like watching those 3D screens that are surround, you know, screens. It, look, it feels very real, and you think it's, still happening, still going on. Those people are still fighting the same battles after all these years. You know? That's not the case, it's just history. So time in that sense is 
All the action is here. Everything doesn't happen. There is such a thing as time, and it's very fundamental to reality. Um, the past is just the past. It's history. It's like a book. You go to the library, you open it up, and you see the knight on his horse. So in this case, you see, feel, smell, and the knight's doing stuff. It's alive. So like the, the newspapers that Harry Potter reads. The other is the future works the same way. You can go to a future reality and you can see how things are working. You can see interactions. You can see things going on. It's like a movie again. And you can ask for the most probable thing, the tenth most probable thing, the most improbable thing. And the database will give you data. But there's no free will being exercised there or in the past. Free will is always here in the present. Now, you can parallel process. You can be here in this reality doing something and be in another reality frame doing something but that doesn't happen that often you have to have a lot of experience to be able to do that most people can be here sleeping or here in a meditative state you know laying in a bed or sitting in a chair doing nothing and be someplace else out of body remote viewing or someplace else doing something but it takes a little more practice to be carrying on a conversation here and at the same time, living another life someplace else, making decisions there, making decisions here. It's a little harder to do, but you can do that too. You can, you know, you know just as an example, many of the times that I'm talking to somebody who says, you know, oh, my Aunt Susie just fell down the stairs and is critical and this, can you help or whatever. While he's talking to me about his Aunt Susie, I've already gone, looked at Aunt Susie, done an assessment and I'm helping where I think help is going on, and I can do that while I carry on the conversation. So that's kind of a mild form of parallel processing. So that, yes, that's, that is okay. And in that case, you're just, I call it parallel processing, but what it really is is fast sequencing. I spend a, a few tenths of seconds here, a few tenths of seconds there, a few tenths, you know, it's back and forth quickly enough that it seems continuous in both places. So I'm just sampling. So I'm not actually 100% focused on what you're telling me. I'm only maybe 90% focused or 50% focused. I may miss some details, but I get almost all of it. So it's that kind of thing. It's a, it's a fast sequencing is really what's going on. Your attention is just flipping back and forth between this state and that state very quickly. So you end up getting both states, but both of them are a little fuzzier than they would be otherwise. So maybe that answers your question about time. Yes, okay. This question is related to the question that was asked about time. Could you explain to us in your experience how you can be listening to someone telling you an anecdote or a story and at the same time go to their database to see what happened? Being in two different states at the same time, how can I access the information that my patients have, for instance? Being in two states at once is really not a hard thing to do. We all multi-process all the time. Can you drive a car and carry on a conversation at the same time? Sure. We all drive cars and talk. Can you drive a car and listen to the radio at the same time? You know, and females particularly are good at parallel processing. <laughs> particularly good. You go into an office and there'll be a young girl there as a secretary, okay? She's typing, she's talking on the phone, and probably, let's see, what else do they do? And she's probably looking up, you know, you walk up to the desk while she's typing, talking on the phone, and you have an appointment, and she gets your card, and comes over here through the file and pulls out your card, you know, she's still talking on the phone, and she can do all these things at the same time. It's natural you know, more natural for the females to do that than the, we guys tend to be more one track. We get focused on something and don't bother talking to us because we won't hear you. You know, we're focused and we do one thing at a time and when that one's done, we'll do the next. But doing three things, four things, five things at once is, is not our thing. But you can train yourself to multi-process. And the more people you interact with, the more multi-processing 
you do. So it's not a difficult thing. We all do do it to some extent. We can all um, do more than one thing. What happens is you don't do any of those things as completely and fully as you would if you were just doing them alone. You're kind of spreading yourself thin. So it's just a matter of having one focus on the road and the steering wheel and the car and another on the conversation. So part of your brain is processing you know, velocity and speed and, and space, and the other part of your brain is listening to what's being said and formulating a reply and doing a conversation. So doing two things at once is just something you have to learn to do, something you have to practice. Like I said, you're really sampling. It's really a fast sampling is how it's done. So you, you take your attention away from the driving partially and partially put it over to the conversation. So that's, that's what's going on. It's not a hard thing. So practice. How do, you, how do you talk to your patients and analyze them at the same time? Just practice. You get into an altered state. First, you have to be able to get into your altered state easily and quickly. If you need to burn incense, cross your legs, and sit in a quiet place, or lie down in order to get in an altered state, then you're at a big disadvantage, right? Now that's, you're limited there. You can't do that except in a quiet room in a bed. All right, well, you, you have to learn how to get in that altered state like that, without lying down, without the music, without the binaural beats, without the incense, without all that stuff. And here's a way to learn to do that pro parallel process. First, just meditate. Get to where you can get the point consciousness and just get a good meditation state. Now, after you're good at that, change the way you do it. Let's say you always meditate sitting in a chair. Well, now meditate lying down. And the funny thing is, when you first try to lie down and meditate, you'll say, it doesn't work. It's impossible. I can't meditate lying down. Just nothing happens. I have to sit up. Well, of course, that's just your belief. Just keep at it. You'll eventually begin to meditate lying down. Then go back to sitting up and lying down until it doesn't matter. You can do either, one as easily as the other. Then learn to meditate standing up. Okay, you can just stand up someplace and learn to meditate. Then learn to meditate with your eyes open instead of eyes shut. Then learn to meditate with your eyes open walking through a park. Now you have to parallel process. You don't want to trip over a sidewalk crack. You don't want to fall in a manhole. You know, you don't want to walk out in front of a car or run into somebody. So you have to keep track of what's going on in your environment, but you still can get in that same meditation state. Then learn to meditate while you're riding on a bus or in some other noisy, you know, chaotic kind of an environment. That's a little harder, but eventually you'll find out that even in the middle of a mall on a shopping day, you can walk through the mall and meditate. This builds up your ability to meditate without ritual. It doesn't have to be quiet. It doesn't have to have your eyes shut. You don't have to be lying down or standing up or sitting or anything else. You let all those ritual comforts go and you realize it's just connecting to a different data stream and you can do that. Another thing to realize is that when you meditate and you get in that point consciousness, it's not supposed to be fuzzy. It's not supposed to be foggy. We have this idea that we meditate that we want to it's getting deep, you know, you're getting deeper and deeper, you know, that sort of thing, like the hypnotic thing. You're going down deeper. And what that means to us is it's getting foggier and foggier and our consciousness is real tenuous. And we think that's the right thing to do. And you say, wow, I had a really good deep state today. I was just hanging on the edge of losing consciousness. That's really not what you want to do. You want to have your meditation state be crystal clear, just like we are now absolutely awake but not connected to this data stream connected to some other data stream you don't want to be foggy so foggy isn't the answer if you if you feel like foggy is the thing you're trying to achieve then you're very self-limited because you'll always be in these experiences of altered states and you'll miss half of it because you're foggy it's half asleep you don't see anything clearly that's because it's so deep but if you were to see things clearly that would mean that you weren't in a good meditation state you'd be waking up 
and then you'd end it. So you wouldn't be waking up at all. So don't, you can feel like you're perfectly awake and be in that altered state. Don't associate foggy, dreamy, drifty states with deep, good meditation. They don't mean the same thing. So, you know, those are a few, you know, a few things to keep in, in mind. But you can learn to multi-process by learning first to meditate quickly in any environment. You need to be able to do it. So when a patient walks in, you can immediately change to an altered state, do an analysis of them, look at the light spots, dark spots, if you're a medical doctor, get some idea what's going on with this person, what's wrong, uh, their attitude toward it. You can look at spiritual body, mental body, you know, astral body, feeling body, etheric body, you know, all these things. What are all these bodies? They don't exist. They're metaphors. It's just different kinds of, of uh, you know, retrievals from the database, different query. Query for spiritual data, you'll get a picture that shows the spiritual body. Okay? You query for physical medical data, you know, you'll get the physical body or you'll get the emotional body. All these things are available to you. It's just a matter of your intent and how you query the database. So you can do all that, but if you can get into that meditation state in a tenth of a second, by the time that patient walks from the door to in front of your desk or wherever it is, or you walk from the door to wherever they're sitting, you can have all that done by the time you get there. You see, it's just intent. And you can still walk and not, you know, not trip. You can still have your eyes open. It takes practice. Just like meditating sitting up, if you always meditate lying down, it takes practice. It always seems impossible when you first try to do something different like that. But we want to get rid of the rituals. Lying down to meditate is a ritual. Sitting up can become a ritual. We don't intend it to, but it does. It becomes a habit. And then we have a habit that we have to break. And we all know breaking habits is difficult. So better not to establish habits in the first place. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could meditate and it didn't have to be quiet? You know, it only took seconds to get there and seconds to come back. See, that makes it a lot more practical. This is something that takes an hour out of your day because it takes you a half hour just to get relaxed and get the incense burning and the, you know, and the music playing and the, the kids quiet and all the rest of it. It's almost too hard to do. Yeah, so that's, that's how you get to multi-process. You practice and you do things that force you to let go of habits and crutches. And you can learn it. Entonces, a través de la meditación podemos llegar a estados al... Thank you. So, by meditating, can we achieve altered states? And do these states just happen on, it, on their own? Do we just learn to meditate and in time, we, I suppose, we get better and better. But these altered states, Will we have access to them through meditation? Will they come on their own, or are there special techniques in order to reach them? Okay. Meditating is an altered state. When you're in a meditation state, you're in an altered state. You don't have to meditate and then go to an altered state. Your meditation state is an altered. Altered state means you're not in this state of consciousness. You're not in this physical matter, reality, you know, objective world. Your, your mind, your consciousness is elsewhere. You've detached from this world and now you're in an altered state of consciousness. But there isn't just an altered state. There's lots of different kinds of altered states. And these you learn just by practice, just like your healing. When you first do healing, you're you're probably okay at it. You may heal, you may be successful 60% of the time. Okay. And that's a good for, you know, that's okay for a beginner. 60% you know, of the time is pretty good. 50% of the time is usually chance. 60% of the time means you're doing something. Okay. Well, that's good. But what you'll do then is when it works, when you're accurate, when you're able to do something and you kind of have proof that you're doing it, you go back and say, well, how did that feel? What was I in? 
You know, what was that like? And then you try to go back in that state and the states where it really doesn't work, you'll say, well, what was that state? And how did it differ from the one that worked? See, and it's just trial and error. And eventually you'll get the ones that work and you'll know how that feels. You'll get the sense of it. And then you can get to that state quickly. You do that with other states. The states for remote viewing might be different. They may feel different than the ones for healing, you see. And it's all personal to you. With experience, you build that up and then you can go to that state. If you're communicating with a being and you'd like to communicate with that being again, just think of the being with your intent. Bring up the being and your intent and you have a communication. And you can communicate to that being whether that being knows it or not. You'll be connected to their consciousness. Whether their local awareness of it is there or not doesn't make any difference. You can connect to that being and, and, and interact with that consciousness. So it's, there are many altered states which you just learn and there's no way anybody can teach them to you because they're internal states. So you just have to learn them. But basically meditation creates an altered state and that point consciousness state is the doorway to all of it. After that, it's a matter of doing and seeing what happens and then learning from what happened and doing it again, doing it again. So you can see how this might take some years, right? It's not something that you develop quickly. It's something you develop with lots of practice. Concretely, how can you change a belief? How can you change a belief? Well, the first step in changing a belief is that you understand that it's a belief. That's the biggest step. Mostly we have beliefs and we have no idea they're beliefs. We have all sorts of beliefs about way reality works, about our causality, about all sorts of things. You know, we have hundreds of different beliefs and we don't think they're beliefs. When we have a belief, you know what we think it is? The absolute truth and it couldn't be any other way. It's a fact, it's the way it is. That's what we think. We don't say, oh, that's a belief and I believe it. We don't say, I, I know, I believe that I can't go from A to B without motion, therefore I'm going to go through a tunnel. You know, we don't have that kind of intellectual process. We just go through the tunnel because it's a belief and we don't even know that that's why we're doing that. The larger consciousness system is not full of tunnels with lights at the end. That's a metaphor for I'm here, it's there, I need to go toward it. And the light is the metaphor for knowledge, for acceptance, for you know, good stuff is the light, dark is the bad, scary stuff. So moving toward the light's a metaphor. We interpret that metaphor visually, you see? And we do that because we believe that we have to go, we have to move to get there. So it's just a belief. Nobody realizes they have that belief. That's just a fact. If you want to go from here to there, you have to move. Otherwise, you'll stay where you are. We all just accept that as a fact. Well, in the world of consciousness, there is no space, there's no distance. You don't have to move. When you're remote viewing, you don't fly, you just appear, you teleport. In that world, your intent takes you wherever you go. You teleport around. There is no space. The around is a metaphor, you see. There's just data and how you interpret the data. That's, what's, that's really what's going on. Your consciousness interpreting data. Think of all those little, all those little people in the egg in the, uh, in the matrix. And they were out walking up and down the street, going to work. They went home, they had family, they had children. They made calls on the telephone, they did everything. And all that being was, was sitting in his little capsule with a plug plugged into the back of his head, getting data. You see, and the whole world was out there based on that data and his interpretation of the data. Well, it's sort of like that. 
So there is no space. That, that world that he worked in, you know, the, that he walked to work or drove a car, all that stuff. There was no space, there was no volume, there was no distance. You see, it was just information. And once you understand that, then you can, you can get around in the larger conscious system just by teleporting. And all the information is just uh, telepathy. Now here, if you want to teleport around in this virtual reality, oh, now you're starting to mess with the rule set. See, now you're, trying to, now you're starting to violate the rule set. And you can violate the rule sets privately or in small groups, as long as it doesn't create a problem for the, for the schoolhouse. You don't want to disrupt and have discontinuities in the reality system. Okay. If all of the data that we receive need to be interpreted, then what happens with uncertainty? Is it not also data that we don't know if we can interpret? <laughs> There's uncertainty in our interpretation, obviously, because we are interpreting it based on a limited set of information. So we, are, we don't know everything. We only know what's in our experience. We get data and we interpret it the best we can within our experience, but there can be a lot of uncertainty in that interpretation because we're making it up. We're making metaphors and we're making symbols that are the kind of best fit to the data, but they may not be perfect fits. So that's uncertainty. That creates a lot of uncertainty for us. And there's just natural uncertainty in the system. In this virtual reality, there's lots of randomness in the system. So the things that we see, now let's, let's, talk, about the, let's talk about the car crash. Okay, now there is a car crash and we all look, and five of us are on the same corner, we look at the car crash. Where does that uncertainty come from that makes all the difference? You know, the police read the ports and the, and the police aren't too certain exactly what happened because they're all different. Where did that uncertainty? That just came from the interpretation, right? Everybody sees it differently. Everybody bases their judgments of what happened on their own experience. To one person, there was this maniac driver going too fast. And to the other person, there was this person dwaddling in the road, clogging things up, you see. And those are two different interpretations of the same, of the same thing. So that's a large part of it. But there's also, just the inherent uncertainty. You've got all these people interacting, all with their intents, all crosswise with each other. I'm intending you to do this, but you really are intending to do something else. And we have all this going on. So that creates a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty just means that we don't know. Uncertainty doesn't have to be some pure mathematical uncertainty. It's just un practical uncertainty in the sense that we don't know what's going to happen next. We're uncertain. We can't predict. I'm glad my chair isn't there. Yeah. We can't predict what's going to happen next. We just don't know, and that leaves us uncertain. You see, that's where that uncertainty comes from. So uncertainty can be programmed into the data. Uncertainty might be programmed into our data. We may get a data stream that has uncertainty inherent in it because that gives us more choices. If we're certain exactly what all the variables are, well then, you know, this is obviously the choice, you know, it's, it starts to get more deterministic. The uncertainty provides options and choices. So sometimes the uncertainty may indeed be in the data that we get. Or maybe we get just pure perfect data and we put uncertainty in it the way we interpret it. And all of the above happen. But we need uncertainty. We need not to fear uncertainty. We need to let things happen outside of our control. We need to not control things. Be uncertain. Live gracefully with that uncertainty and just say, okay, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I've done my best. I've done what I think's right. Whatever happens will happen and we'll all deal with it. You know, let the chips fall where they may and we'll all deal with it. I've done what I've done. I've done it with concern for everybody that I know of and now it, uh, 
just let go. So that's, that's the way we have another question. Is there a pot in the kitchen back there or something that we could, yeah, that won't take long to fill up. Ah, that'll work better. There we go. <laughs> Good. Um, let me get a headset on. In my opinion, we wait, let me reread this because uh, it's not very clear. Wait, wait, wait. In my opinion, we will die when we have already finished living what we have to live and go through and learn in this life. My question is, if we take too many risks or risks too, too often, like jumping from a parachute every single day, can we, can we die before learning what we should have learned? Or do the risks that we take not matter? because we will die whenever we have to, meaning when it's our time? Yeah, okay. Um, the answer to that is if you take unnecessary risks, you're liable to end your existence here prematurely before you've done whatever it is you've come to do. Okay? That's just the nature of it. There are no guarantees. When you come here, you come here to experience and to make choices. If you make bad choices, you reap the benefits or the problems with those choices. If you choose to leap out of an airplane three times a day, every single day, the probability of you hitting the ground too fast once goes up than if you don't jump out of an airplane at all. You've just increased the probability of that happening. Okay, so when you increase the probability, well, you know, you jump out of the airplane with a parachute, right? And then you reach up and pull the string. That's the measurement. What happens next? Does the chute open or does it not? Well, there's a probability that it will and a probability that it won't. That's a measurement. A random draw goes up and you take a draw out and see what's gonna happen next. And oh, good, the chute opens this time. And maybe, you know, 900 times out of a thousand or 999 times out of a thousand it will open, but there's some probability it won't. And every once in a while that random draw will pick that one in a thousand and the chute won't open, and you go splat. That's just the way the random draws work, you see? In that case, you took too many risks, you ended before you did what you came to do, and no big deal. You just started again another time in another place. That chapter was a short one. You can start the next chapter soon afterwards. So it's not a terrible thing in that sense, but it's a waste of an opportunity that you had and set up, and now you gotta start back and find out you know, which way's up, what's the difference between mommy and daddy, you know, how do you tie your own shoes, you got to go back through all of that again to get to the point where you already were able to do more, you know, uh, quality choices. So it's, you waste a little time that way. But, uh, yes, you, you, it's not like my point in life is to make this connection and I could jump out of an airplane with no parachute and if I hadn't made that connection yet, somehow I'd land in a haystack and I'd be all right. It doesn't work like that. You take risks, things happen. There's a lot of uncertainty here. There's a lot of what I call you know, Brownian motion. Brownian motion is a physics term for molecules. In a, you put a bunch of molecules in a box and they just bump around into each other. And because they all bump into each other, they kind of fill up the whole box because they're all being bumped and knocked around. And that's called Brownian motion. It's a statistical thing. We're like that socially we kind of exhibit social Brownian motion. We all bump into each other and it changes our lives. Why did we marry the person we married? Because we happened to be in that neighborhood at the time where we were looking for somebody to marry and that's who we ran into. Had we run into somebody else or had we turned left instead of right, you know, we'd have bumped into somebody else, we'd have married them. We think that's a big thing, but a lot of it's just randomness. Who we meet, where we live, kind of people we hang out with. 
stuff happens and then you deal with it. You see why it's really not a whole lot of point trying to manage the stuff that happens? You can't manage it. There's too much uncertainty. You just drive yourself nuts trying. Make yourself unhappy. Let it happen and deal with it. Okay. How should we deal with a loss or how should we manage losses? If the loss you're talking about is, is a death of a loved one, am I assuming that's the, that's the subject, not the fact that the stock market went down? Okay. You should have an attitude when a loved one dies, not that something terrible and awful has happened, but that a new beginning has started. Okay. That person, whether it was from an accident and they were young, or maybe they're old, it doesn't matter. They're going to be starting a new adventure. So it's not the end. You have to think first that death is just like the elf. You know, it's just a temporary thing. It's a, it's, it's a change of avatar. They're going to have to go get another avatar and start another game. So that may be inconvenient if you're young and lose a little time, but it may be a relief if you're old and in pain and can't really do much for yourself anymore and your life quality has kind of gotten pretty low. So depending on the circumstances, it should either be, you know, sad because now you're going to miss them, right? So it's sad, but in the same way it's glad because they're going on, particularly if it's an older person who's suffered because they're, you know, when you're old, it's not fun being old because things hurt. You can't do stuff you used to do. You need a lot more help. So that's not a lot of fun. So you're going to get another opportunity to do it all again in a fresh, new, energetic way, and that's good. So you should have those kinds of thoughts about it, that this is not a terrible, awful thing that's happened to this person. It's a terrible, awful thing that's happened to you not to them. They're just dying. They're just going to get in another new life. Now you're going to have to go on without them. So that's sad. And we tend to feel more surely sorry for ourselves. Most of our grieving, as it turns out, is we're grieving for us. Oh, you know, woe is me. I'm going to, have, I'm going to miss that person. They were so important to my life. And I love, you know, and it's all about us and how we feel and how we want them back and what we want but can't have. And that makes us miserable. And what is all that? Ego. It's just ego. It's fear. How am I going to get along now without them? Fear. How will my life be changed? I don't want my life to be changed. Now everything is going to change. Fear. You see? So most of that negativeness that we get is our own fear, our own ego. We're worried about us and what we're going to have to put up with, the changes we're going to have to make, and what we're going to have to do without. It's not about them. They're going on with their existence, with their evolution. So think of it from that point of view, and maybe the burden will get a lot lighter from a bigger, from a bigger picture point of view, that death isn't really death. The consciousness never dies. It just moves on, and it has to move on. It can't stay the same. Who would want to become 90 years old and be 90 years old forever. Being 18 forever may not be too bad. Well, maybe 21. Well, maybe 30. You know, you can kind of, there's advantages of all those ages. There's advantages of being 92. You've seen a lot more and you've got a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience that the 20 year old hasn't even imagined yet. You've had opportunities to learn a lot more and grow a lot more than the than the teenager who's still very self-centered, you see? So there's advantages that come with that age, but then it's time to let go and go on. So that's, I'd say, what you, that's how you deal with the loss of a loved one, is you see it from a bigger picture, and don't see it from inside your fear and your ego, and don't make it about yourself. Let it be about them. So as you lose your fear and ego, your response to other people's death starts to change you start to see it differently. And it's not that you become detached and really don't care. You still have passion, you still feel sorrow, 
it's sad, you're going to miss them, and that's all real, but you don't let it take over your life. You deal with it, right? Stuff happens, people die, you deal with it. How you deal with it is what's important. And if you wallow around in self-pity for a long time, that's not the right choice. If you're sorry, you pay your respects, you remember, you give thanks for the time you had together, that's the way to deal with it. And then you go on with your life. Okay. Hmm? Oh, okay. Okay, there was a question that says, uh, how many times a day should you meditate and how long each time? And roughly, if you meditate just twice a day, and that doesn't mean two times right next to each other, but you know, like morning and evening or morning and afternoon, they don't have to be exactly timed or anything, but just two times a day. And if you meditate for say 20 minutes each time, that's not so much to ask, 40 minutes out of a day. That's just kind of typical. You can do more than that. You can do less than that. If you meditate for five minutes a day, you'll be better off than if you don't meditate at all. If you say, I only have five minutes to spare, and you meditate for five minutes, instead of saying, well, that won't do any good. I just won't do anything at all. Five minutes is better than nothing. You'll learn something eventually with your five minutes. It'll just take you longer. So. 20 minutes each time, twice a day. More if you wish, less if you wish, but that's a good, that's a good uh, start. You'll make good progress with that, with that much. Now last, yesterday evening, we did a meditation and I spent a little bit of time explaining to people how to meditate and what to do and what not to do and so on. And evidently we had such a good time and it was so eventful and everybody learned a lot and loved it so much that I've been asked that we do it again. And now's a good time to do it again. So we're gonna do it now. It's only 15 minutes, so it doesn't take a long time. We're gonna do a short meditation. And I wanna give you a, a, a very brief, for those of you who weren't here, couldn't stay yesterday, I wanna give you a very brief idea of what to do and what not to do. Okay. Meditation is not something you do. It's not something you accomplish. It's something you let happen. Don't try to make it happen. Just let it happen. You should have no expectations of what you will experience. None. If you experience nothing at all except sitting still for 15 minutes and not saying anything, that's okay. Okay. You have to start with that being okay. That nothing happens at all has to be all right. If that's a failure for you, then you've already set yourself up for failure. Don't let that be a failure. Nothing at all is still just fine. So that's the attitude. Now, you, you get there by just being quiet and still and relaxing, let go, open yourself to whatever experience happening. Now, this is not an intellectual experience, so tell your intellect to go sit down and take a break for 15 minutes. Okay, I've been burning that intellect up pretty heavily, you know, so now it's a chance for the intellect to go sit down and take a break. So don't think about it, don't judge it, don't analyze it, just experience it, whatever it is. Okay, whatever it is. We're gonna do the same one we did last night because everybody liked it so much. And if you wanna use a mantra, remember I told you, sering, sering, just sound it, it's just fluff, it means nothing, it just keeps your mind from wandering around because your mind is focused on that sound. It's just a sound. You can repeat it, you can repeat it quickly, you can repeat it slowly, you can let it go all together. The whole idea is that fills up your head with the sound so your head is not running around judging and analyzing and your intellect isn't yappity yappity yapping on all sorts of things and 
will jump into your mind. When those thoughts come to you, don't get upset that you're not doing it right because now you're having thoughts and you're thinking of things. Just very gently say, oh, I'm thinking, put it aside, go back to the mantra or go back to focusing on your breath or whatever it is you do to meditate. And if you don't want to do a mantra, focus on your breath and just sit there and let go, that'll work too. See? You don't have to do the mantra, it's just a tool. And later on, if you get some binaural beats, you know, you can listen to those. So there's, the, the point is, you're supposed to do nothing. You're supposed to just be an experience. That's the state. And if you just be an experience and do nothing, you'll end up in an altered state of consciousness called a meditation state. Now, when I say you let go of this environment, that means not that you won't hear traffic in the street, You'll hear traffic in the street. You just detach from it. You're not interested in it. You don't operate on it. You don't say, oh, that's traffic in the street. That must be a big truck. Oh, that must be a really big truck because of that. You know, see, that's your, that's your intellect, operating on stuff. Let that go. It's just a noise and it doesn't matter. If people cough, if the door opens. You know, we had something up here, it growled and roared last night. I don't know what it was, you know, a, a heating pipe or something was oscillating, but Stuff will happen, there'll be noises, there'll be coughs, there'll be rustling around. You'll hear things, just let them go. Don't attach to them. And when you don't attach to them, guess what? They kind of disappear from your awareness and you turn them off. But they don't disappear, that's okay too. You close your eyes because that shuts out a lot of data coming in through your eyes. Eventually you'll meditate with your eyes open if you want to, but for now, shut them. Shut out that data because it's one less thing for you to operate on. You don't want to operate now with your intellect, you just want to be. Now once, we get, once you get to a meditation state, if you want to heal, if you want a remote view, if you just want to hang out there because it's such a lovely place to be, just experience, do what you want to do. It's your time. Or you just sit and experience it. Meditation states are very pleasant. They're very warm and fuzzy. They're a nice place to be. You'll feel more energized when you come back. You'll feel more like smiling when you come back. It's just a nice, pleasant experience. Okay, so for the next 15 minutes, don't do, think anything. Just be who and what you are. Okay. And I will, uh, I will, when it's time to come back, I will tell you that. I will uh, announce it, I'll bring you back. So uh, don't worry about anything. You don't have to look at the time or anything else. Just be. Okay. Take a deep breath. Let everything go. All the worries, all the concerns, all the issues, let them go and begin your meditation. But right now, I'd like to say, does anybody have sort of a question about the meditation? People probably felt vibration states where your body was like, mm, 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 like that. They may have felt electric things. You may have seen pictures. You may have seen colors just coming and going. All these things are kind of typical for being in a meditation state. The vibration state is your body getting in sync, usually at the theta state. Sometimes then it slows down to a solar pulse, that's you transitioning to lower theta state. All these are normal, just let them be. Don't struggle with them, don't be afraid of them. Sometimes people hear noises, sometimes you'll see images. You may even have a conversation or two. Don't be startled by any of it, just go with it. Remember, you're just experiencing. It's just an experience. Where will this take me? Who knows? Let's go there and see. That's the attitude. So if anybody has something they, they want to say, something special that happened to them that they want to share, or do we uh, go into the next thing?
whatever that is. Our, our leader will tell us what the next thing is. Yeah, we had a, do we want to do that in English or Spanish? You need a microphone or they won't hear you in the booth. How do you know you're not daydreaming? ¿Cómo sabes que no estás soñando de día o? What was that? Have I only? Uh, how do you know you're not daydreaming? How do you know you're not daydreaming? Okay. Well, there's a couple of answers to that. One, daydreaming is usually thinking about things, thinking about process. That's usually the chatter we're talking about is the daydreaming. If you're daydreaming, you're daydreaming about something, about a subject, probably about doing something, or what you need to do, what you didn't do but you should have, uh, what you've learned, what you haven't learned, you know, you're just chattering on. That tends to be what we call daydreams. If you're just basically empty, sitting there empty, experiencing the void, that's pretty sure that's not a daydream. Okay, that's, a, that's something different. It's just an altered state. If you feel the heat, on your body, and now it's cooler than it was just a few minutes ago, you know, then you, you know that you weren't just daydreaming. So those are, those are some, of the signs, some, of the kind, some of the signs. If you feel the pulsation, you're not dreaming. But now, daydreaming is another altered state. That is an altered state. That's not the normal state. When you're daydreaming, you do often let go of what's going on around you in the physical world. You do let go of things, but you generally don't let go of the intellect. In a daydream, the intellect is usually going. But a daydream is an altered state, and daydreams are very useful. There's lots of people who, let's say you have to give a speech. You're going to stand up and talk on some subject to a couple of hundred people, and you're really concerned that you say you know, just the right thing and you don't look like a fool, you've got fear involved in it, you've got ego involved in it, you want to really do a good job and you're concerned about them that, uh, that you won't tell them all the things they need to know. So, you've got, so you want to practice your speech. The way we practice our speech is mostly is in our head. That's like a daydream. We'll sit and we'll think about the speech. We'll see ourselves walking up on the stage and then we'll kind of, how are we going to introduce ourselves and how are we going to introduce the subject and we're going to start with a joke. What are we going to do? And we start planning it out. And all this is in our head. This is a daydream. It's daytime. We're not in this physical reality. We're on a stage. It's a daydream. It's another virtual reality and it's a very useful virtual reality. So, you know, that's just another... So how do you know it isn't just a daydream? How do you know this altered state isn't some other altered state? Well, it's kind of hard sometimes to tell altered states, but there are some signs that I told you about, but actually it doesn't matter. The question you ought to ask is, was it useful? Did I get something out of it? Was there something there that felt good or felt different or felt like I maybe would like to do it again? Is there anything to it? If there is, then it doesn't matter whether it's a daydream or whatever you call it. The, the, the name of it doesn't matter. Is it useful matters. It should have been useful at least to give you a few minutes to reflect and just relax without having to be thinking and thinking and operating all the time. So that should have been useful, at least. Well, that's good. If it is, Feel good about doing it and, and don't worry about you know what it was or what it wasn't. Just accept it for what it you know for just what it was. That's the don't analyze. Don't judge. Just experience. <laughs>